It is therefore time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Well, good morning, Speaker, and thank you very much. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. The Liberals today debated one of the most appalling time allocation motions this legislature may have ever seen. That's right. As the government tries to stop debate on their flawed Buy American Bill. Stop the clock. <clears throat> That's not helpful. Indicators are that we need to go to warnings, and I will. Next outburst will go to warnings. As the government tries to stop debate on their flawed Buy American Bill, they are flying in the face of democracy. It is an affront to this House and to all members. Right. They are not allowing any committee hearings in Ontario and only 30 minutes of debate. Shame. 30 minutes Shame. to discuss legislation attacking our biggest trading partners. No there is no longer any doubt, Speaker, that this bill is simply a crass political ploy. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier stand in this House and support Question. such an affront to democracy? Mr. Speaker, I am standing in this House and standing up for the workers in this province. Quite remarkable, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the opposition would not understand how important it is that we support and stand up for the businesses and the workers in this. Both sides have had their turn at it. We're now in warnings. Premier. Our government values the deep and long-term relationship that we have had with the United States, Mr. Speaker. I just came back from Washington. I have met with uh, 38 governors, Mr. Speaker, with Congress people, wow. with senators. Mr. Speaker, the, the impression that we are leaving in the states, the work that we're doing to bring people together, to to push back against the protectionist wave that is Answer. going across that country, Mr. Speaker. That is something that is very important for the well-being of the economy of this province. Yeah. And I would have thought that he would have understood that, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. They are stopping debate when they don't have any idea of the impact of this legislation. Inside Trade magazine asked the Premier, quote, was there an, any analysis done to determine if your bill would be WTO compliant? The answer, while, quote, there was always a legal analysis, I actually don't know the degree of risk. They asked, quote, are you worried this might be illegal at the World Trade Organization, that this might result in a challenge in Geneva? The Premier, quote, we're pretty sure we're okay. Pretty sure, Speaker, isn't good enough. Speaker, they were pretty sure that Windstream was NAFTA compliant, but we're still now on the hook for millions. Mr. Right. Speaker, is the Premier right. pretty sure she's okay with stopping debate on a bill that could end up in the courts? Mr. Speaker, what I am absolutely certain of is that it is extremely important for us to have a proportional response to protectionism, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, absolutely. on the part of the United States. Yeah. It is absolutely critical that in this time of uncertainty, Mr. Speaker, we establish that we are going to protect and we are going to support the workers and the business of this province. Mr. Speaker, we don't want to get into a trade war with the United States. All right. We're there. The member from here on Bruce is warned. Finish, please, Premier. The last thing we want is a trade war with the United States, Mr. Speaker, but we must respond. We are working extremely hard to make sure that everyone who is uh, having a decision-making role in the NAFTA discussions understands how integrated our economies are. But if there are Buy American policies that are going to That's threaten right. our businesses and workers, Mr. Speaker, yeah, we're, we're going to make a proportional response, and the opposition up. should be supportive of that. Yeah. 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 You see it, please? You see it, please? I've got two on my radar now because of my standing. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce believes the best approach for Ontario is the formation of 
positive bilateral cooperation with our American neighbours, not retaliatory legislation. The editor of the Canadian Centre for Excuse me. The President of the Treasury Board is warned. Finish, please. The editor of Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives is quoted as saying, the reality is U.S. states have a World Trade Organization carve-out permitting by American, while Ontario restrictions on U.S. bids will be illegal. But it's clear this crass political ploy will only lead to more trouble down the road, Speaker, whether it's directly with the state or with the World Trade Organization. Mr. Speaker, is the Premier still pretty sure the bill won't hurt Ontario's business? Because I think the answer is pretty clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's just finish the quote that the, uh, the, uh, the member opposite started. So this is the quote that he began from uh, Rocco Rossi, who said, who's the president of the C and CEO of the Ontario Chamber nice of Commerce. And he said, yes, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce believes that the best approach for Ontario is the formation of positive bilateral cooperation with our American neighbours. This is the approach the Premier and her government have taken to date, and they must continue to do so. We acknowledge the province has already been active on this through their state engagement strategy. Mr. Speaker, we are on this. We are on this. We've been on this long before the opposition even was aware that there was an issue, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that meeting with folks in the states that work. It's pretty difficult to ask any one individual to stop when both sides are yelling back and forth at each other. But I can find you. You have a wrap-up. We recognize that working hand-in-hand -hand with our federal government to deepen the relationships in the United States are, uh, is important, and Thank we've you. been doing that, Mr. Speaker, but we're also going to stand up for Ontario Thank businesses you. and workers. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, when questioned about the SEIU-backed home care agency, the Premier said, quote, We are working with personal support workers. We are working with the people who are on the front line. We're going to do that. We're going to support them. But, Speaker, that can't quite be correct because the Ontario Personal Support Workers As Association doesn't support this agency. 95% of the providers are suing the government. Ow. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals actually work with PSWs and scrap this home care agency? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I said yesterday, um, we are talking about the people who are doing the, the important work of caring for the most vulnerable people in our society, whether it's the aged, Mr. Speaker, or whether it is people with disabilities providing care for folks in, uh, in our communities who, who otherwise would not be able to have uh, dignity, Mr. Speaker. So the work of PSWs is incredibly important, which is exactly why we have been working with them. It's exactly why we delivered on, delivered on our commitment to raise the new base wage for uh, publicly funded PSWs to $16.50 an hour, Mr. Speaker. We made it clear that they had not seen increases and they needed to be supported, Mr. Speaker. We created the $10 million PSW training fund, uh, which has supported training and education to PSWs yes, working in home and community care, Mr. Speaker. We believe that the people who are doing this work need to be supported and they, they need and, and deserve to have a professional, uh, a professional organization, you. Mr. Speaker. That's why we've been working with them. Back to the Premier. Again, when questioned about the SEIU-backed home care agency, the Liberals cited other countries and states that use this model. Washington State. Great. That's one rife with controversy, alleged malfeasance, and several lawsuits. They mentioned Australia, which actually does not use a central government agency. In fact, None of the countries the Liberals referenced have created a central government agency outside of that one in the U.S. The Ontario model does not make sense, not for patients, not for providers, not for PSWs. Mr. Speaker, it is clear this is only for the SEIU. I again ask, 
Will the Liberals scrap this agency? Here, here. Just to what the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care said yesterday, let's just make sure we understand that what we're trying to do is make sure that people who need the services of PSWs have choice, that they have the opportunity to get Member from Leeds, Grenville, is warned. are able to get the care when they need it and where they need it, Mr. Speaker. So to that end, we've committed further investments to PSWs in, uh, in our 2017 budget, including a continued investment of $250 million in 17-18 for community and personal support services, up to $10 million annually for eligible organizations for education and training in the home and community care sector through that PSW training fund. And these investments will, will help meet the increased demand. We recognize that there's increased demand, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there is pressure on PSWs, which is why we are working with them to make sure that they have the tools to deliver, as I said, the care that people need and that patients have access to the choice that they're looking for, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Eleven agency that represent 95 per cent of the providers are suing the Liberal government. Their judicial application reads, quote, home care patients, including those who would be served by the agency under the ministry's plan, are amongst the most vulnerable individuals in Ontario, and the government's unilateral decision to create the agency will cause distress, confusion, and anxiety. Sure Speaker, dis the agency will cause distress confusion and anxiety. It's shameful that the government is proceeding. Mr. Speaker, is a home care system full of distress, Question. confusion and anxiety really the best system for Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And let's be very clear about what we are talking about when we're talking about our model for self-directed care. We estimate only 1% of all home care clients in Ontario would be eligible for the services of this PSW employing organization. And the program will only be implemented in a small number of regions in the province at the outset. Some four LINs will be involved. And uh, these self-directed care initiatives will be subject to the most rigorous third-party evaluation based on looking at cost-effectiveness and, I think, the most important piece is client satisfaction. Answer. Our goal is to look after clients in their home with a particular model where there is continuity of care, where the PSW involved is totally involved in the care. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Donna Simmons is an 87-year-old constituent of mine. On Tuesday, Donna's daughter stopped in to visit her at her home, and her mom wasn't looking very good. She rushed Donna to the hospital in Welland right away. They were told Donna had a heart attack. What happened in the ER should never happen to any family in the province of Ontario. For nine hours, Donna, a senior, 87 years old, was put in a wheelchair in a crowded emergency room hallway to wait for a bed to become available. The hospital was so overcrowded that there wasn't even a stretcher available to lay an 87-year-old senior who'd had a heart attack on. How can the Premier hear these stories day after day in this House and continue to say that there isn't anything that is going wrong in our hospitals in Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, let me say to, uh, to the family that uh, I'm sorry that they uh, are going through that difficult time. Uh, that would be, it would be stressful for, uh, for anyone, and I, uh, I'm very sorry that uh, that, that mother and daughter had to, uh, had to go through that experience. Mr. Speaker, we know that there's more to be done. We yeah. know that there is more that needs to be done in terms of, uh, of alleviating the stress on hospitals. That's why $500 million was in 
our last budget, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've been invested in 1,200 new beds, Mr. Speaker, and that uh, and that th those are being extended, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there has been, particularly as the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has said, particularly a, a difficult period because of the the flu surge right now, Mr. Speaker. But we recognize that we need to continue to support our hospitals as well as to the previous question as well as care in the community because there is an increasing need because of the aging demographic mr speaker we understand that and we are working with our hospitals to uh, to ensure that we continue to uh, put the resources in that they need mr speaker thank you supplementary speaker donna was in severe pain for 9 hours She's 87 years old, she's a senior, she has severe arthritis in her back, and she was forced to wait nine hours in a wheelchair in a hallway, and she should have been in a bed on a heart monitor. Donna is still in the emergency room waiting to be moved to a floor, one of two floors in the Welland Hospital. Speaker, how does the Premier hear stories like this, stories like Donna's, day in and day out, and continue to make conservative-style cuts to our hospitals and health care system? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I also, of course, uh, um, very touched and, and concerned about uh, what we've just heard today from the member uh, from Welland. Uh, and as the Premier has said, of course, we have been taking steps to alleviate these sorts of situations. Um, as uh, I think everyone knows, we had the uh, 2017 budget, we invested over $500 million in funding. That's over half a billion dollars in Ontario hospitals, giving a really significant increase to the hospital sector. So we are working on the hospital side of things, but of course, in this particular case, we're talking about a senior, and uh, we are working very hard on the community side, hopefully to prevent such uh, situations as we've just heard. So in addition to adding these 1,200 hospital beds through the funding increase. We're also providing some 207 affordable housing units for seniors uh, who need additional community supports when they're discharged from hospital. And we're also creating a number of transitional care spaces Answer. outside of hospital for a further very large number of patients. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, hospital overcrowding and hallway medicine are not new. Uh, it, they, they really are a reality in this province, and the situation didn't get like this overnight. The last Conservative government fired 6,000 nurses and closed 28 hospitals. The Liberals have shortchanged hospitals for the last 15 years, $300 million last year alone, forcing cuts to hospital staff and to people like Donna who I talked about uh, today in the emergency department. Why is the Premier carrying on the conservative tradition of cutting health care services for Ontario families and people's, people like Donna? Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Speaker, so of course the hospital beds are most important in the acute care system, but some of these other community supports are exceptionally important as well. Uh, so I just want to make sure the, men, uh, the member opposite knows about the 150 new transitional care beds at the Reactivation Care Centre. Uh, this is particularly to serve Northern Toronto area and York Region, very important in my community. Uh, and also uh, 75 beds at University Health Network's former Hillcrest site to provide care for those transitioning out of hospital. Now, I do agree certainly with the comments in relation to the previous uh, Harris government, but I'd like to remind the member that when the NDP were in power, they closed 24 per cent of acute hospital beds in the province, they closed 13 per cent of Answer. health beds, and a grand total in their last budget, closing 9,645 hospital beds. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Hospital for Sick Children is a world-class hospital. It's amazing doctors and healthcare professionals perform little miracles every day. Yesterday, I toured Sick Kids Hospital and spoke with children and parents. It was very clear that the Premier's answers yesterday was a huge disappointment in light of the crisis that they are coping with. Sick kids is running out of room. 
It's been overcrowded every single month for the past year. In January, staff treated more than 8,000 children in their emergency department, setting a record for the more patient at any point in the hospital 143-year history. The overcrowding at sick kids Question. hasn't been solved. It's getting worse. Why won't this Premier do what's right for children and stop the overcrowding in our hospitals? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, we certainly do recognise uh, the stress placed, uh, certainly this past year, on our hospitals, and particularly in sick kids. And uh, uh, having interned there and having had my daughter have surgery there, of course, I think we all know what excellent care that hospital provides. And we know that our health care providers are stressed. They are working overtime. They're doing their very best, of course, with their unwavering commitment to patient care. But to go back to what we did this last fall, we invested $100 million to create 1,200 new hospital beds across the province. And that's equivalent to six new medium-sized hospitals. And so we've begun to see how valuable this additional support has been to our hospitals. And we've already made the commitment that we're going to renew this investment, increasing the new funding to our hospitals for the coming year to $187 million. Wow. Great. Thank you, supplementary. Back to the Premier. The incredible healthcare professional at SickKids are doing the very best they can in very cramped spaces. But it is this government that it is not doing enough to help. The neonatal ICU is running at 115% occupancy. Nurses are tripping over equipment. Every hallway, every nook and cranny is jam-packed. Children who receive bone marrow transplant have to stay Question. in their tiny room without a bathroom or a shower for six long weeks. Six weeks. Sick kids need immediate relief now and capital investment to rebuild and expand its facility. So why is the Premier refusing to stop Thank overcrowding you. and helping sick kids? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So specifically to sick kids, through the 2017 budget, our government increased annual funding to sick kids by some $9 million to continue to support them in their delivery of the world-class health care to the children most in need. And since September, Ontario has provided sick kids with funding for 20 new beds. And we commit to this ongoing work with our hospitals to uh, analyze exactly what they need and to provide it uh, uh, over time. Now, this year, as has been said, has been particularly difficult. Uh, influenza B, one of the strains that was circulating, particularly affected uh, children uh, in this last year. So the need for um, the surge capacity Answer. obviously has been proven this year. We will continue to analyze the needs and accommodate as necessary. Thank you. Final Thank you, Speaker. For too long, people across this province have been asked to settle for overcrowded hospital or for cuts to our health care system. It should not be that way, Speaker. It absolutely does not have to be that way. Sick kids should not be forced to operate at 115 per cent occupancy in this neonatal intensive care unit. It shouldn't be losing worst-class surgeon, and it should not be forced to provide 21st century medicine to the sickest of children in spaces that have not been updated since 1949. What will it take for this Premier to stop denying the problem, stop making excuses, and start providing the capital investment that sick kids need right now? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, uh, we're looking very closely at the capital needs of uh, hospitals. Uh, there has been some allocation of uh, funding for planning uh, for new construction. And I just want to make sure that the uh, member opposite does understand, because since 2003, we've increased our investments in health care each and every year. There have not been any cuts. We have been uh, increasing funding to treat more patients.
And so, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to improve care each and every year and to reduce wait times to some of the very shortest in the country. We have more to do. We acknowledge that, but we're listening to our hospitals Answer. and we're working towards uh, obviously maintaining this world-class system that we have here Thank in Ontario. Thank you. Yeah. New question, the member from Elgin Middlesex London. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It's a little jeopardy for the Speaker, uh, or for the Minister, Speaker. Uh, this hospital's emergency department had the busiest month in its 143-year history in January 2018. For this past year, this hospital has been over capacity, and since December, this occupancy rate has been over 108 per cent. Mr. Speaker, this story isn't nothing new. The dire straits of Ontario hospitals are facing today are not rare or even occasional occurrence in the province anymore. It's happening across the riding in Elgin, Middlesex, London, in Sudbury, Hamilton and Ottawa. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd have an easier time telling the minister uh, where are the hospitals that aren't chronically overfunded or overcrowded. Excuse me. Speaker, based on the challenges I've described to you and the questions that I've posed, could the minister tell me which overcrowded Ontario Question. hospital I'm speaking about? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to uh, say to the member opposite that we have a very comprehensive system of health care in this province. It includes some 144, I believe, hospitals, 143 perhaps. There have been some amalgamations. Um, but of course, that's not all. We have so many ancillary community support services, and uh, we're committed to looking regionally at the needs. We know that the demographics in this province do vary considerably. Uh, this is why our government established local health integration networks, so that we have that local input to ensure that we have uh, individuals. Obviously, everyone knows Linz are governed by a board. Uh, they have uh, 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 divisions looking and analyzing constantly at the needs of their communities. And so we respond as the ministry to what we hear from the ground, and we do our very best to accommodate those needs in a thoughtful, uh, analytic way. And, uh, and uh, uh, we will continue to make this progress that we have made very substantially over the course of our government. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, what we've seen over the past 15 years is this government invest in large bureaucracies and administration. We've seen them form the CCACs into 39 cents of every dollar going to administration. We've seen the Ministry of Health expand from five deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers, to over 20 with a full complement of staff. What we've seen, though, is a cut in frontline services and overcrowding in our hospitals. The situation I described previously is the sick kids just down the street. Street, the world-renowned Children's Hospital conducting cutting-edge research and providing innovative, life-saving care, but it's busting at the seams. Children in critical care are having to squeeze in a room with five other patients, and their families sometimes have to be there in the most stressful and scary times of their lives. Speaker, this government should have seen this coming. It's not because it's a one-off year. It's years of underfunding, Question. despite warnings from sick kids and other hospitals in the province. So will the minister finally listen and commit to fully funding our hospitals in this upcoming budget? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, any suggestion that the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care is a bloated bureaucracy is a complete myth. In the past 13 years, the health ministry budget has almost doubled increasing from about $30 billion to $52 billion, while staff, while administrative staff have decre decreased by 50 per cent. <clears throat> and so, uh, we are committed to ensuring that uh, Ontarians have the health care that they need, where and when they need it. I'd like to ask the member opposite, where exactly does the uh, opposition party stand on this? As far as we know, the PCs have absolutely zero dollars for hospitals in their platform. Thank you. No question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. Well, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, my constituency offices, like probably every constituency office in this House, has been having parents come to her office completely stressed out that their children, who used to get medication by the private covers, uh, the coverage that they got from their work uh, benefits, once they show up at the pharmacy, 
if the drug is not covered by Pharmacare, they end up being rejected and having to go back through an entire bureaucratic process of trying to get the medication covered. For young kids, this is a very serious issue, as you well know, because a number of them can't be off the medication for a period of time because of their medical condition. Why did the government put in place a program if you hadn't figured out how to make sure that people would not have interruptions when it comes to getting the drugs that they need? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. The reason uh, that we have instituted OHIP Plus, of course, is to ensure that every child in this province has access to the drugs when and where they need them. We have 4 million children and youth that can now access 4,400 drugs. These are essential, of course, antibiotics to treat infections. Everything that a child needs, asthma inhalers, insulin, seizure medications, antidepressants, etc. And so, obviously, we have instituted this to level the playing field, to ensure that every child has the opportunity to thrive and to have good health. And so, Answer. we instituted this program. and. So many people have already uh, taken advantage of it. I'll uh, uh, give some Thank more information you. in the supplementary. supplementary. Minister, uh, as a New Democrat, we don't need to be uh, preached on the benefits of pharmacare. We're the ones who came out with it. The fact that you followed, that's a good thing. But the point is this. I can tell you that if we were to put together a pharmacare program to Stop the clock. Come to order. Finish, please. You have a responsibility when putting together such a program to make sure that kids don't fall off the system. I have at our constituency offices, I'm sure that we have at all our constituency offices, as you do, people coming to your door and saying, I want to renew the prescription for my child, and I was not able to because of the bureaucratic bungling of the creation of this new plan. So my question to you is, what are you going to do to fix it so kids don't have to go without the medication that should be covered by the plan in the first place? Okay. <laughs> we Minister. have taken uh, this premier and our government has taken a historic step yeah. and a program of this ma magnitude it's a program that is positively benefiting 4 million children and youth here in Ontario so leading up to January 1st we worked closely with a number of prescribers specialty clinician groups and insurance providers to ensure a smooth trans transition to coverage through OHIP plus and so in fact over 800,000 young people aged 24 and under have already had their prescriptions filled at no cost under OHIP+. Plus. More than 1.7 million prescriptions have been filled to date under OHIP+. Plus. And so the numbers continue to grow. And of course, we know that while this uh, program does cover some 4,400 uh, uh, drugs. There's also the opportunity, yes, if a drug is not covered in this way, to access a drug through the exceptional access program. And I, as a physician, remember very well taking advantage of that excellent program. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity Spadine. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Transportation. When I'm out in my community talking to residents about their thoughts and concerns, I always hear transit. Transit can make or break a person's day. That is why it's so important that we're not only having enough transit, but we also have to have good quality transit that people want to use. Speaker, I know that the people of Trinity Spadina live a very busy life. When they are on the move, they are, they are often responding to their work emails, arranging plans for dinner, or taking care of one of many other tasks they have to do on a daily basis. Speaker, would the minister please tell the member of this House what our government is doing to improve the transit experience for riders by making Questions. it easier to get online while riding on our Go network? Good thank question. You. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I really want to thank the member for Trinity Spadina for his question, but for his staunch advocacy on behalf of transit oh, hey, riders hey, in oh, his yeah, community. Yeah, boy, Speaker, on. last week I was really pleased to be in the member's community <laughs> at the, the UP work. Express station at Union Station to make a very exciting announcement. 
Our government is bringing Wi-Fi to the GO network. In, in June 2017, we released an expression of interest for Wi-Fi providers. Now, coming this spring, we'll be testing the service on two trains and four GO buses. This approach will allow us to receive important feedback from the commuters so that when we roll out Wi-Fi across the entire network, we get it right. Speaker, Wi-Fi on GO trains and buses is the number one customer service improvement requested by GO Transit riders, and that's exactly what we're delivering. This is a major step forward, and I look forward to seeing the results of this trial as we plan to bring Wi-Fi service across our entire GO network. Well done. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for her great work in the answer. I know that Wi-Fi will encourage even more commuters to take transit. Making transit more enjoyable and more convenient helps the commuters to make choice to leave their cars at home and hop on transit at their local GO station, streetcars, or bus or subway stops. Speaker, I know that we need to continue to make these type of improvements. At the same time, we can't afford to press pause on building new transit and increased services. Mm -hmm. This is something I hear regularly from transit riders in my community who want to see progress. Speaker, would the minister please provide the members of this House with more information on what our government is doing to make taking transit an even better option when also, while also continuing to increase the service we provide? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for Trinity Spadina for all his work on this subject. Speaker, Wi-Fi is readily available at the majority of GO Transit stations. We know that commuters appreciate that service, so making Wi-Fi available on GO Transit vehicles is the clear next step. But, Speaker, to make your commute even easier, we're also updating the GO website. This new website will, will improve your commuter or your commute through tools like a fare calculator that helps you to determine your go fare with cash or presto, service update information for trains, buses and stations all in one location, and an easy-to-use trip planner. Speaker, while working to make your trip more, conveniently, more convenient and more enjoyable, we also continue to add new service whenever possible. We're on our way to deliver 6,000 weekly trips, up from 1,500, and improving the experience for our commuters is, is a, a very important step along the way. I can't wait to see how this rolls out, and we're very pleased to offer this new service. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Foreign Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have a question to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, the Mother Risk Commission released a damning report regarding the flaws in this government's hair strand drug and alcohol testing, a flawed and discredited toxicological methodology. The report highlighted the use of false evidence to facilitate the removal of children from their homes, breaking up families, and damaging communities. In 2014, Toronto mother Tamara Broomfield won a court appeal after being convicted in 2009 of feeding her toddler cocaine, a faulty conclusion reached by the mother risk method. Mr. Speaker, the government knew there were concerns, yet did nothing for two years. The public's confidence is shattered. Will the Minister of Children and Youth Services share his plans to rectify this gross injustice done for Ontario's most vulnerable? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question. Um, the mother risk report did come out this uh, week, and I'd like to thank the commissioner for her hard work. It was thoughtful work, and uh, the recommendations that she made were accepted by my ministry. And I know the attorney general was there as well. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the commissioner for her work, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, a lot of the recommendations that were in that commission uh, speak about. Um, uh, the reform and the modernization of the child welfare system here in the province of Ontario. We went through an exercise this year, um, and uh, we brought forward some legislation, uh, Bill 89, 
um, and it spoke to those pieces. There was a lot of um, similarities between the report and, um, and uh, what our bill did. For example, in our bill, we talked about cultural competency, but it was a progressive Conservative Party who voted against Answer. that bill. And uh, we still don't know why the progressive Conservative Party voted against Bill 89. Thank you. Wow. Supplementary. Again to the minister, children were ripped away from their families under false evidence. Starting in 2014, there were reports in the media that the alcohol in hairspray can affect test results. The media was aware, the public was aware, yep. the Attorney General was aware, so obviously the Ministry of Children and Youth Services had to have been informed. This calling. government was warned and knew the concerns, yet it was only in May of 2017 that this Liberal government found it appropriate to consider the issue of accreditation standards for Ontario labs. Mr. Speaker, affected families are seeking justice. On their behalf, I would like to ask the minister why it took his government years to finally start a review of the mother risk test program. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the member for the question. Uh, my heart goes out to the families that were affected uh, by the mother risk testing, and um, uh, we uh, announced uh, when the report uh, came forward that we would continue. Uh, to provide counselling services to all the families affected. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, immediately we announced that we'd put together a task force of, uh, of uh, people from across the province, uh, folks from the Indigenous community, uh, from the Black community, uh, other communities that were affected by uh, the mother risk uh, testing. Um, it is important for us as a, as a government to ensure that uh, children are at the centre of uh, decision making. And um, again, that's why we brought forward Bill 89. You know, it's, uh, it's ironic that the uh, member can stand up in this legislature and talk about positioning children for success, but we brought forward a bill, Bill 89, the most comprehensive piece Answer. of legislation to protect children here in the province of Ontario, and you voted against it. Thank you. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. At the age of 13, Alicia Raimondo was in a place of darkness. She couldn't imagine living another day. At 14, she tried to take her own life. Luckily, she woke up in hospital. But then she had to wait seven years to get the mental health treatment that she needed. This is just one of thousands of tragic stories of children and youth who are being put into danger by the failure of this government to provide the mental health services they need. Will the Premier commit to eliminating the wait list for community-based children and youth mental health services? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member uh, opposite. Uh, I know the member is a, a passionate uh, advocate for young people in her riding, and of course, uh, young people here in Ontario. You know, when it comes to uh, mental health services for young people in this province, um, we don't want we don't want young people to uh, to have to wait. Uh, to get the services they need. And that's why we move forward with moving on mental health uh, um, strategy here in the province of Ontario. You know, when we launched that strategy, we invested an additional $100 million in around 2012 and started the process to look across the province to better coordinate services. The, uh, the member opposite has, um, has looked at, at, at bringing forward some solutions, and they believe that it's just about money. It's not just about money. It's about organizing um, our, or, our agencies on the ground to ensure that, that they're working together to, bet, to deliver the best possible services to young people, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier, Speaker. In 2012, the government committed that within three years we would have a system that must deliver early and appropriate help for each child and youth who needs it. Speaker, three years after the government's own deadline, and we are still waiting. 12,000 are waiting, some for as long as 18 months to get the treatment they need. Tyler Henderson struggled with mental health, but never got the help that he needed. He was in and out of hospital. He self-medicated and ended up living on the street. Now, fortunately, he uses that experience to help others in a similar place, but the outcome could have been so different. Speaker, the time for talking is over. 
Children's mental health is in, is in crisis and demands urgent action. Question. I will ask again, will the Premier commit to eliminating these wait lists? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, been making uh, many improvements in the system over the last few years. Um, for example, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue to invest every single year uh, additional money into mental health in the province of Ontario. And the former Minister of Health and the new Minister of Health, we've made a commitment uh, that we are going to uh, add more money into mental health. But it was about building a strategy that organized our agencies on the ground, and they're moving on mental health. There was a commitment to reorganize our lead agencies, and we've done that. 31 of 33 regions now are reorganized, and we're working with those lead agencies to better deliver services. Good thing. Mr. Speaker, we added mental health leaders in 72 school boards. We funded This provided 770 additional community mental health workers across the province. We've set up uh, youth, uh, youth mental health hubs in the province of Ontario that have an alternative uh, delivery model. Some are 24-7 where young people can go in and just drop in and get the services that they need. So we have been making improvements Answer. and we will continue to move down a, a, a pathway to provide better services for young people when they need it Thank right you. across this province. Your question, the member from the Toba Coast Centre. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, once a month I hold a seniors advisory group meeting to meet, where I meet with seniors and I hear from them about the issues that are important to them. And when I started having those meetings, I started to hear about the issues you would expect to hear about. I heard about health care and transportation and housing. But then I started to hear about an issue I didn't expect to hear about, and that was door-to-door -door sales. I started to hear speakers story after story from constituents who had been the victim or knew someone who had been the victim of a door-to-door -door sales scam, where salespeople use aggressive, coercive, misleading sales tactics to dupe people into contracts, into products that are bad for them, that dupe them out of their own money right at their own doorstep. And that is why in 2016 I introduced a private member's bill to ban door-to-door -door sales of certain products where these practices were widespread, like furnaces and water heaters and air conditioners. And so my question is to the minister. Minister, can you tell this house and share with Ontarians what we are doing to protect Ontarians from these misleading and aggressive door-to-door -door sales practices? Thank you. Yeah. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Amitobico Centre for this very important question. And um, of course, protecting consumers in Ontario is of paramount importance to our government. And uh, I'm very happy to share with the House today, Speaker, that as of today, March 1st, the unsolicited Solicited sale of certain prescribed goods at the door will no longer be allowed in Ontario. <laughs> we, developed, we developed this list of banned products after extensive input from consumers. And we will monitor the list to ensure that it remains relevant and effective. It includes air and water treatment devices, such as water heaters, furnaces. And I want to thank again the member from Etobicoke Centre for his work, his advocacy. Thank you. And, uh, Supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. And this is really fantastic no news, and I know consumers in my community will be thrilled to hear about, about this, as will consumers across Ontario. And I also know that this is part of a number of things that you, Minister, are working on to protect consumers in a number of areas, with the support of a number of caucus members that surround me here today. Uh, Minister, as I said, I've heard from far too many constituents, from concerned consumers, who had been taken advantage of by these coercive and misleading door-to-door -door sales practices. Um, as a result, it's been sold products, consumers have been sold products they don't need, products that don't work, products that were priced far above what they should have been, and they were duped into fees and they couldn't cancel their contracts, couldn't get out of these terrible contracts. And while this is an issue that cuts across all ages and backgrounds, I noticed that these door-to-door -door sales practices tend to uh, disproportionately affect our most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable people in our society, and it is beyond reprehensible to me that there are people who have a business model based on taking advantage of vulnerable consumers. So today I am proud. I'm proud to have worked with you, Minister, on this, and proud that you uh, adopted my private member's bill, and proud that we'll be protecting consumers from aggressive and coercive question. sales practices in Etobicoke and across Ontario. So my follow-up question to, minute, to you, Minister, is what are we going to do? What penalties and fines are in place Thank to you. make sure that people adhere to these new laws? Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Again, thanks to the member for the question. And just to be clear, this legislation is to go after those bad actors, not not good businesses who um, are conducting themselves properly, in Ontario. And uh, we're determined that the penalties in the act will be real deterrents, and uh, as such violations of our new rules uh, will will be make contracts void. And the best part, Speaker, one of the best parts of this legislation is that consumers will be able to keep the goods and services with no obligation if that contract is uh, deemed void. So that's fantastic news. In addition, businesses soliciting for these goods and services and will be required to keep records, they'll be required to provide more information to consumers, and of course there's always a 10-day cooling Thank off you. Uh, period, Speaker, for New question, the member from Sonia Lampton. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, this afternoon, members of this legislature will be debating my motion, number 64. The motion calls on the government to immediately strike an advisory council on pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infections and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, also known as PANDA-PANS. The Council would advise the Minister of Health on research, diagnosis, treatment and education related to this disorder. Pandapans may affect as many as 1 in 200 school-aged children and in almost all cases has been misdiagnosed. Minister, can I count on your support for my motion and making the Pandapans Advisory Council a reality? Good. Thank you. Minister of Health, Thank you very much to the member for Sania Lambton for his question, and I was certainly very intrigued when I read his motion uh, because pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infections and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome was not something I learned about in medical school. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is actually, my experience is uh, probably the experience of many physicians, and the member opposite has made reference to the fact that some of these rare conditions are often misdiagnosed. They may have symptoms uh, that mimic other disorders and so on. So the, this is a, a very real uh, situation. And uh, we have recognized, our government has recognized that there are a number of rare diseases in, in this sort of a, a, a category, and we recognize how frustrating it can be uh, for families, obviously for the individuals affected as well, uh, when confronted either with yes, no sir. diagnosis or a mid-diagnosis. So I certainly look forward to the debate this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Supplementary. Yes, thank you, Minister. And I, my understanding, I, I, spec, I spoke with your predecessor, and he also uh, had lots of time for this. Minister, children affected by panda pans often experience an abrupt onset of tics, obsessive compulsive behavior, and severe depression and anxiety after a common strep infection. In the members' gallery today, we have members of the organization of Panda Pans Ontario, including Executive Director Carrie Henriksen and her son Jonah. Each and every one of our guests has a personal story of how their lives have been impacted by the fight to have either themselves or their loved ones properly diagnosed and treated for Panda Pans. Minister, will you commit to setting aside some of your time, and I know your busy schedule, to meet with Ms. Hendrickson and the families of Panda Pans of Ontario to learn more about what our great province can do to help them? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm certainly very much prepared to meet uh, with the parents and the individuals here today. Uh, because of uh, this important issue around rare diseases, uh, the member did reference some, some of the symptoms that are involved, and I, I just want to reference back to OHIP Plus, because now we know through OHIP Plus many of the drugs required uh, for these children, in fact, are going to be provided completely free. But also, I want to remind everyone that, in fact, our government has has uh, formed a rare disease working group. It's yes. made up of experts yeah. who can explore how services for people with rare diseases in Ontario can be improved. And uh, the group is led by two experts in this field, Dr. Ronald Cohn, the pediatrician-in-chief of the Hospital of Sick yes, Children, sir. and Scott McIntaggart, Senior Vice President, University Health Net Network. So we already have a group that can look at the situation regarding these two uh, particular Thank disorders as, as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Four years ago, the former chief of Grassy Narrows First Nation, Elder Steve Forbester, took the extreme and desperate steps of going on a hunger strike to draw attention to the historic and ongoing poisoning of, from mercury of his community in nearby Wabasamong First Nation. At that time, the minister and now Indigenous Relations committed to former Chief Forbister that action to change the badly broken system of compensation for the victims of mercury would follow. The federal government took thousands of samples of hair and blood from hundreds of members of these communities between 1970 and 2000. And only now, after a fight, are these community members gaining access to their question. own samples. My question is this. What has the minister done to honour his commitment to Chief Forbister to fix the broken compensation system and create a mercury treatment home? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Premier, Change. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, that very important question. Um, speaker, we're really concerned by the many challenges facing Grassy Narrows and the Wapsamong First Nation. Our government is committed to working uh, with First Nations to clean up the English Wabagoon River system and to achieve real progress that will create a prosperous, healthy, and strong communities. Back in December, Speaker, we passed legislation that will provide $85 million in dedicated funding for the remediation of the English and Wabagoon rivers, and we're doing that with the active participation of a number of uh, Indigenous communities, Speaker, in an open and transparent way. We are sharing the data, we are inviting people to be on site, and we are listening to the needs and the concerns of those communities. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier, the community has had to fight, the community has had to scrap, and even have their youth thrown out of this very building, threatened to starve themselves, to get recognition, and are still waiting for action from this Liberal government. My question again to the Premier, what will your government do to ensure that every member of these communities receive compensation for the intergenerational harm done to their health, livelihood, for the exposure to mercury? Thank you. Minister. Uh, to the uh, Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Speaker. Reconciliation. Speaker, there have been a number of actions taken to address this problem. I take you back to February 17. That's when we committed to Grassy Narrows First Nation and Wapsamung, or White Dog, and the federal government to explore options to reform the Mercury Disability Board. Subsequent to that, in February and April, the four parties, the federal government, the two First Nations, and Ontario <laughs> met in April. Uh, as a result of that meeting, there was a further meeting in October where the, uh, my ministry received a letter from White Dog indicating their concerns about Mercury Disability Board reform process. As a result of that letter, I met with Minister Phil Pott and the leadership of Grassy Narrows and White Dog to discuss this issue further. As a result of that, we met in December again, the four parties. Various written submissions were provided. Answer. And as late as January 18, uh, or in January 18, We've uh, uh, met with the representatives again. We are making progress on that. All of the parties Thank you. are making their best efforts to resolve this. Thank you. The question, the member from the Public Works North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Wealth and Forests. Sir, His Worship, uh, Mayor Jim Watson of the City of Ottawa. Clearly, by his demeanor, he misses question period. Speaker, uh, this is Invasive Species Awareness Week, and as stewards of our environment, clean air, clean water, and maintaining the diversity and integrity of our flora and fauna, there's a number of important initiatives coming forward. For example, these species can be very devastating to rivers, plants, animals, and of course to our economy and way of life. So I'd like to know from the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, what actions are we taking during Question. Invasive Species Awareness Week in this domain? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for Etobicoke North and his interest in the invasive species. First time as Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. And my first
last word will be to thank my predecessor for the great work that's, that she has done on this file. She's now the Minister of Transport, but I want to commend her for leading us through the, 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 on this file for so many years. I also want to thank the, the ministry and all the team across Ontario that actually is doing day in and day out protection Ontario's biodiversity, because that's what we're talking about. What we're talking about when we're talking about invasive species, we want to protect Ontario's natural habitat and the biodiversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's our duty, not yeah. only for this generation, but for generations to come. Right. So that, what, that we are the only province in Canada that has an Ontario Invasive Species Act. It's unique, and it allows us to actually take action for prevention from eradication of the, uh, the species, and I look forward to explaining more what we're doing with the legislation. In Thank you, supplementary. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Minister. Programs and initiatives that we're taking to deal with uh, invasive species, and as you will know, especially, we're Ontario is now celebrating 25 years of the Invasive Species Awareness Program. This, of course, are many, many partnerships between the provincial government, and, for example, with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And of the past 25 years, we've had a number of successes. Whether we're developing, for example, cutting-edge new biological control agents for uh, perennial grasses, whether we're uh, dealing with the launch of eradication programs targeting, for example, species like uh, water soldier and water chestnut, I know that you, as with so many other domains, will not allow Ontario to get trumped. S'il vous plaît, est-il possible pour vous, Madame? Would it be possible, Madam Minister, to elaborate on these programs about these invasive species? Mr. Speaker, the member is right. We cannot work alone. We need partnerships with several people from the civil society. See the number of actors that are involved in this fight wanting to protect Ontario's biodiversity. So in a way, I think I want to thank the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters who are contributing to this fight. We also have in Sault Ste. Marie an invasive species centre where we've invested over $11 million to help us understand well what's good science to go ahead and, and deal with invasive species. It's important that we recognize how threatening they are. They can choke our local native species, and that's why we want to ensure that we have good science and a good participation of civil society. On this side, we take our responsibility towards the environment very seriously, and we have been leaders on this file, and we continue to be leaders in protecting the Thank Ontario's you. environment for the future. Following the long tradition of the speaker introducing former members, even though some try to do it in a different way, we have with us in the members' gallery the member from Ottawa, West Nepean, in the 38th and 39th parliaments, Mr. Jim Watson. I believe there was a point of order on this side. The member from no, okay. The, the, the minister, the former mayor of Ottawa, His Worship Mayor Jim Watson, who no doubt is here to uh, uh, patrol the corridors looking for any minister that has a checkbook. The member from Durham. Mr. Speaker, I I just wanted to. Uh, remind the members of this house to meet the engineers on the staircase for a photo op. The voter registration group will be there as well. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I believe the President of the Treasury Board may have a point of order. No, thank you. She's passing. <laughs> there being no deferred votes, this house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.